before we actually get into the specifics of FirstNet and what you've been doing, I'd like to learn a little bit more about how you landed in this space, both as a leader in the technology field, as well as the intersection with public safety. Sure thing. So started my career about 30 years ago, initially focused in the private sector, uh, working for Motorola Cellular and Siemens uh, Mobile at the time. Spent about 10 years deploying cellular networks worldwide. Uh, that was really in the transition to 2G with the digital communications and some of the early 3G technologies as well for data broadband. About 15 years ago, uh, I took an opportunity at the Department of Commerce Boulder Labs, which is just right down the street here on Broadway, uh, to work within the Public Safety Communications Research Program. And this was about the 2003-2004 time frame and really focused on initial narrowband voice communications for public safety. The standards and development of the Project 25 standard suite. This was after 9-11, if you recall, and really focused on interoperability, voice communications for public safety. And then as things moved and progressed into public safety broadband, I had the opportunity to join the First Responder Network Authority and uh, create and build the test lab here in Boulder that I'll talk a bit more about as we go through the talk today. Uh, very excited to be involved with public safety in the community, bringing them the technologies they really need to do their jobs and save lives. Excellent. And so what was one of the more formative leadership experiences that you've had that have kind of led you to this really important point that we're at today with FirstNet in particular and the efforts you're leading? Great question, Rebecca. I think when uh, upon the first involvement, and public safety has been advocating for 20 years to get a dedicated network for their communications. And I was able to see firsthand the leadership that the public safety community, the firefighters, the law enforcement, emergency management, and emergency medical services, all the leaderships of those key organizations that came together to advocate and uh, lobby Congress and the administration at the time for a dedicated network and legislation to create that. Uh, I think as most of you are aware, uh, most of public safety, there's not a lot they can all agree on. Uh, they have their unique focus and areas for their disciplines. This was uh, uh, fantastic to see how they all came together, uh, put together a public safety alliance to help drive and get this legislation passed to create broadband and dedicated network for public safety. Great, and so I think most of our participants have some basic understanding of what FirstNet is about, obviously providing a nationwide high-speed broadband network dedicated to public safety specifically. I think you've described it and FirstNet has as a force multiplier for first responders, giving you communication tools and solutions that help save lives. But can you share more with what FirstNet really is about and what you're looking to accomplish? Sure thing. So there's really two key aspects. There's the First Responder Network Authority, of which I'm a member as the Chief Technology and Operations Officer. We are a federal agency within the Department of Commerce. As part of the legislation that was passed in 2012, it directed the creation of the First Responder Network Authority. And its uh, charge from Congress was, we're going to give you $6 billion and 20 megahertz of 700 megahertz spectrum, prime spectrum. Go find a business relationship that will work and a partner that can build this network for public safety. The Office of Management and Budget and GAO estimated this is a $45 billion network if we, if we were to do it from the ground up. Obviously, we did not get $45 billion as part of the legislation. So we had to create a public-private partnership via a request for proposal process through uh, open source, uh, open competition for the request for proposals. So we, we immediately began consulting with public safety. Again, public safety led the charge to get the spectrum and money for this. Uh, we spent about four years working on all 56 states and territories, meeting with public safety directly, understanding their needs for this network and how to develop our request for proposals. And we came down to a focus of six, 16 objectives that we used in our RFP and told industry, here are the objectives public safety has told us they need for this network to be successful and for them to adopt it. Because the other key factor, Congress gave us the money in the spectrum, but there is no mandate that public safety subscribes to this network. So we knew it would be a competitive environment as well, which was a welcome change for public safety communications, bringing competition to their marketplace, bringing them a device ecosystem and applications ecosystem uh, that they could work from on the network. So that was really the key tenets, 
Uh, in 2017, we released that RFP. I'm sorry, in 2016, we released the RFP. And in March of 2017, we awarded that nationwide contract to AT&T, who is our partner building this network. And you'll see the other, uh, I mentioned two lanes, the other part of this is the FirstNet network. So you'll see two different mentions, the FirstNet authority, and then the FirstNet network that AT&T is actually building uh, with the FirstNet authority as the uh, contract manager, making sure they are delivering what they have promised uh, in the contract. Excellent. So in terms of what does this network mean in terms of data interoperability and the, and the ability to move data for first responders across a network? Great question. So the, the key need, and this was born out of one of the recommendations in the 9-11 Commission report that was published in 2004, is public safety traffic, whether it's voice, data, et cetera, needed priority and preemption on the commercial networks. Public safety had been asking for that from the commercial providers for years. The commercial providers were not willing to do that. They didn't think it made sense for such a small user base uh, on their nationwide networks. Most of the two big networks, AT&T and Verizon, have upwards of 100 million users on their network each. Public safety, the direct uh, first responders, the priority users that we have on FirstNet, count if you count all in the three to five million range. So that's you know, less than 10% of the, an overall big commercial carrier's footprint. It was hard to advocate for them to do certain features just for public safety. What the legislation changed in the passing of this that public safety drove is to get a dedicated network uh, via the legislation and funding and also allow that commercial partner to use our license spectrum. Uh, we have the nationwide license to that band 14 spectrum is what you'll hear. Uh, as uh, the industry can use that for commercial use as well. But the key features we needed built into this network was that priority and preemption capability. Mm -hmm. An analogy I like to use with my family and others that try to understand what that means, when we're all on the highways, we're driving our cars, all of our cars and the police cars and fire trucks and ambulances are all happy together. Once they hit their lights though, all the commercial users get off the highways. Same concept for priority and preemption on a data network. The public safety traffic is identified at the cell site and the system knows this is a public safety user. Let's get all the other commercial traffic out of the way. And that's really been a key issue for public safety and mm -hmm. big events and natural disasters and other types of uh, response situations where they needed access to the network and they were stuck in the queue just like all of the rest of us on the network. Excellent. So that actually leads right into my next question, which is about kind of how FirstNet will impact and improve the use and accessibility of different apps for situational awareness, field data collection, operational coordination. And I know this afternoon some of our stakeholders that are here with us today will be doing an exercise. They'll be going out in the field and collecting data in real time on mobile devices. What, what role does FirstNet play in that, both you know, in the present as well as in the future? Great question. So the role, FirstNet is here and available now. So public safety users can subscribe to the FirstNet service with priority and preemption for that primary public safety category. Uh, what we are doing now with AT&T, uh, we have upwards of 60 devices now on the NIST list of certified devices that will work on the FirstNet system and upwards of 40 applications within a dedicated applications catalog uh, that are available for first responders on the FirstNet network. Uh, so we're continuing to drive that. One of the key objectives public safety told us uh, during our consultation is we want a competitive device and applications ecosystem. Uh, AT&T is able to put in requirements to all of their device manufacturers mm -hmm. to add our spectrum, band 14, as well as these capabilities that public safety has asked for. Our role in uh, the lab here in Boulder that I run uh, working closely with AT&T and our engineering staff and outreach staff is ensuring those devices and the applications work the way they're supposed to work as part of this contract. Excellent. And if I'm not mistaken, the apps that we're going to be using this afternoon in the field exercise are actually available through FirstNet Fantastic. as well. Yes. So. We, we've got a, a backlog of apps that are going through that process. Uh, public safety requested that if it's a certified or listed app within our applications catalog, that ensures it has gone through either security checkpoints or validation that the application works correctly with the features that we're implementing on the FirstNet network. Excellent. 
Um, so kind of taking it up a little higher level, I think it's helpful for public safety to understand what the commitment is um, by FirstNet and AT&T to kind of keep this network around as they kind of migrate and move on to it. You know, wh what does that commitment look like? So the commitment in the contract with AT&T to, to build, operate, and deploy the FirstNet network is a 25-year contract. Again, we, we took a different approach from the typical federal procurement process where they typically give uh, requirements documents that contain 10 to 20 to 30,000 specific requirements that a contractor must perform or shall perform. What we did with the objectives approach is we wanted industry to be able to innovate and bring additional features and capabilities on this network that public safety is actually going to ask for. Uh, so we have a 25-year contract. We're, we're in the initial five years now on the build and the addition of Band 14 Spectrum to AT&T's existing network, as well as a building of, I think, over 1,000 new sites as well for additional coverage, depending on the state or territory. Uh, so this is a long-term contract. As part of this, the First Responder Network Authority is also uh, the, the, the kicker that Congress gave us was, we're gonna give you six billion to attract a partner. We're gonna give you the license that you can use with that partner for them to commercialize and use. But that's it, no more money from Congress. You cannot come back to us. You, FirstNet Authority, have to be self-sustainable on this network and make sure it stays up with technology as 5G and 6G progresses over the next 25 years. So as part of that, AT&T is actually paying what's called a capacity lease agreement back to the authority over the next 25 years that we will in turn use those funds and reinvest them into this network to add the additional features and capabilities as the network matures over the next 25 years. So that's a really unique business model that uh, from what I found has not been done before within the federal procurement space. Uh, we've had a lot of interest from a lot of countries worldwide as well on how we were successful, how did we make this happen. Canada, the United Kingdom, and a several, several others are now trying to implement their own dedicated broadband networks, and we're consulting with them regularly on how that can happen worldwide. Excellent. So before we move on to talking about the lab, I did want to kind of hone in on a story in terms of FirstNet's usage and the, the values that it has had for public safety today. And I, I've, I've heard about some examples of it being used in recent disasters. I don't know if you can share a little bit more about that with us. Yeah, we, we've had several examples and most recently even the wildfires last week in California. Uh, as part of the network and uh, what is being done for public safety, we also have a dedicated suite of 72 satellite cult based cell on light truck based deployables that are located uh, across the United States and available within a 12 hour on site and turn up time for emergency communications in disasters and other uh, situations. Mm -hmm. So that's been a key benefit that the first responders that we're learning a lot of lessons on how those can be used and brought up and used quickly. Uh, we've had a lot of success in those supporting over the last year, uh, several different events, uh, the hurricanes as well as the fires and some of the disasters that have happened on the East Coast. And uh, that so far has been a really game changer for a lot of the agencies that would show up on scene with no network and no ability to communicate. So having that suite of uh, deployables ready for public safety at no cost for the FirstNet subscribers on FirstNet, these are at no cost to those agencies that require them. Um, so we're really excited with that program. Uh, and then as we're building Band 14 into the network over the next five years, AT&T has actually accelerated their build. Uh, they're actually six months ahead of the build schedule. We had milestones tied to uh, the next five years starting in March of, this, of 2018, and they're already almost a year ahead of that build schedule. So we're really excited with the additional capacity on uh, the network. The other key topic that um, I always bring up is AT&T went above and beyond in their response to this. They didn't say, okay, FirstNet and public safety, we're just gonna build you a network with band 14. As soon as it's up, then you can use it. We would have still been waiting now for that network to get fully turned up and spread across the country. What the AT&T team, and they actually briefed this to their CEO, Randall Stevenson, what he agreed to do is let's give public safety what they've been asking for. Uh, I don't want them to have to wait for band 14 to be deployed nationwide. I'm going to authorize and allow you guys to give priority and preemption 
to public safety on FirstNet on all of our commercial LTE bands for uh, public safety. So now we went from a 20 megahertz network to in some markets over 100 megahertz that are available for public safety for LTE broadband with the priority and preemption capabilities. This was a, a game changer and again really changed the market uh, for public safety and, and brought that uh, as a, uh, a really model to follow that other countries are now in, in talks with their commercial carriers on how they can do something similar. And these features have been built into the standards from the beginning of LTE. So that's the other unique aspect and focus is on that standards capability. The third generation partnership project is really where these standards reside for LTE. And these are a part of that suite of standards. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that, particularly the connection sure to some of the standards. I did want to transition and talk a little bit more about the innovation lab here. So about two years ago, FirstNet got opened the first kind of state of the art in testing and innovation lab here in Boulder, Colorado, is my sure. understanding. And this really represented a major milestone um, and opportunity for first responders. Can you share with us a little bit about the mission of this lab? Sure thing. So uh, as you mentioned, it's located about 10 minutes from here. It's right by the Boulder Airport, for those, that of, you, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, Boulder City proper. Uh, we have an 8,000 square foot lab that is equipped with commercial and band 14 bands. Uh, E-node Bs is the term, the cell site equipment, uh, that are tied into the FirstNet core network as well as the AT&T commercial core network. Uh, and we have a development center for application developers as well as we use it for our device validation and testing. Uh, we're entering our next phase now that the contract has been awarded. We are doing a lot of validation activities on these features. We have some other services coming down the pipe from AT&T that public safety has asked for, such as mission critical push to talk, some of the location-based services that the lab in Boulder is now focused on refining the test cases and uh, validating those features going forward. Uh, it's been a great partnership with AT&T. Uh, we have connectivity to their development labs. Uh, and it's an open uh, lab for public safety and first responders to come and visit as well. It's open invitation. We're going to be rolling out events. We want to start hearing from public safety and some of the use cases that they have and you have for data networks and what can be done. And uh, we want to start driving those features into this with that reinvestment funds that we are going to have over the next 25 years. So it's a, uh, been a great development. Uh, there was a request, you know, as part of the legislation, we want it focused on public safety. That's what the mo goal and, and focus of our lab in Boulder is, to ensure we're hearing from public safety and driving those capabilities into the network going forward. That's very exciting. What would you say is one of the, the, the most promising efforts going on within the lab today? I would say really focused on uh, a couple of things. Under helping application developers understand the key features and the APIs that are available on the mm -hmm. FirstNet specific network. Uh, and also some of the um, future capabilities, whether it's uh, the, the drones and aerial type capabilities that we know are gaining a lot of traction now. Uh, we just recently, and we'll be posting this week, we're up to, I think I mentioned, 60 devices that have gone through the NIST list certification process. We'll be adding another 10, hopefully this week. We're seeing our first round of embedded band 14 capable laptops and some of the other capabilities that that will bring uh, onto the network as well. Excellent. And if you could look out, say, five, ten years down the line, is there something that you have your eye on in terms of where the work of the lab may be heading? Sure. Um, and that's a great tee up for, as part of the legislation that I mentioned earlier, there was also $300 million set aside, not out of the first net budget, but separate, uh, that went to the Public Safety Communications Research Program at the Department of Commerce. I think you'll be hearing from Jeb tomorrow that we work closely with. They are now focused on this funding and uh, issuing grants and challenges that really looked at that five to 10 year visible window. What can we do to accelerate some of those technologies? And a lot of the things they're looking at, and that was again based on public safety's input on what they wanted to see some development for them on, is on data analytics, some of the virtual reality training and uh, being able to train, for example, Jeb may talk about this virtual reality challenge that they hosted last year. How can we train firefighters as if they were in a real fire without exposing them to a real fire during training? So there's a lot of virtual reality, augmented reality capabilities. 
uh, as well as some of the voice communications on a broadband network. It operates differently than on a LAN mobile radio network, which is their traditional means of communication. We're ensuring that a lot of the voice quality and other capabilities will be on this when those are rolled out going forward. So we're really excited with the work the PSER program is doing, and we're looking to leverage and pick up that ball once that uh, funding has expired. I believe it's due to end in 2022 and, and move that going forward. Outstanding, and yes, everybody will be hearing from PSCR Great. tomorrow on cracking the code with indoor mapping specifically. Great. So it'll be a good segue for folks. So I'm gonna kind of change gears a little bit and talk about technology and its evolution and, and the fact that it's moving at an ever increasing rate, far outpacing our ability to adopt and implement, particularly in the public sector by government that may not move as fast as the pace of technology often moves. And I, a challenge I see year after year in, in working with our, our community is that they'll hit a point where they'll see a solution, they'll be able to adopt it, but by the time they've gone through the implementation process, the procurement process, all of that, something new is on the horizon that they're ready for. So there's always this, this challenge, and, and I, it, what role do you and FirstNet play in fostering technology innovation and helping to expedite that adoption and implementation process by first responders? Great question. So we also, we have a dedicated team, our public safety advocacy team that's spread all over the, the 56 states and territories that consults regularly with the public safety communities. Most of them are actually former public safety uh, mm -hmm. focused, whether it was a firefighters or police officers or emergency managers or EMS folks on our staff now that are working across all those uh, disciplines for this. We also have, as part of the legislation, a public safety advisory committee. And that is made up of 43 of the largest public safety organizations that the FirstNet Authority uses as our advisory committee on what we should drive going forward. So I mentioned leveraging the lab and, and having hands-on work with public safety. We're also having a strong outreach component to understand and try and see what are those on the horizon that we know need to be pulled into this network or capabilities for the network. And the beauty of our 25-year contract with AT&T is that we can invest in that and make that happen without going through another, to your point, the federal procurement cycle. For anyone that's uh, familiar with the FAR, the federal acquisition requirements, and or, uh, it is very complex mm -hmm. to get through and takes a lot of time. We now have this contract in place that we can drive new task orders, new capabilities into the network uh, with still review and approval through the processes, but much more streamlined because the legislation required those revenues go back into this network for public safety's benefit. And that's something that our, our local first responders can leverage as well. Absolutely, okay. and that's the phase we're in now. Uh, having, uh, we now have a new chairman of our public safety advisory committee, Todd Early from the state of Texas, uh, in driving that uh, outreach through those organizations as well as the staff we have dedicated to it. Outstanding. So you started to touch a little bit on how um, the public-private partnership model that FirstNet represents is starting to kind of trickle out globally. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that, from an innovation model as well as adoption model, is supporting obviously here in the U.S., but what's happening internationally with, with what you've developed sure here? So I think the, the most, the closest country to what we're doing now would be the United Kingdom, and we're actually hosting their uh, senior program management later this week. Our other office for FirstNet is in Reston, Virginia, outside DC. So that's where our main headquarters is with our CEO and some of our other staff. Boulder, we have about 60 staff here, and then the rest of them are dispersed. But in Reston later this week, we're meeting with the United Kingdom. And they've chosen a public-private partnership, a little different than ours, but they are building a dedicated broadband network for uh, their public safety community. Little different model in that they fund the participation on the network. The United States is different in that all of you, it's a, you, know, you, you choose through your procurement agencies how you subscribe to this network. There's no mandate or funding to pay for the subscriptions on that unless it's a local or state program. Uh, the other one is South Korea. They are very uh, quickly pushing to uh, deploy their nationwide network. I think they're in the final stages of, of their evaluation and selection phase. They've had several key pilots. 
the United Kingdom had really a, a, a upcoming deadline. They had to switch entirely off of their voice network, which is a Tetra-based system. It's a uh, land mobile radio technology that they use in the United Kingdom and switch everything to broadband. I think they've realized over the last year and a half that may be too quick. The technology may not be quite there to turn off our Tetra narrowband voice system right now. Uh, let's do a more phased approach. So that's what they're coming in to discuss with us later this week. Uh, the other country is Canada. So the unique thing with Canada is they also set aside this band 14 spectrum in 700 megahertz for their network. Now they are going through the process. I think they've been given uh, money from the high levels, uh, initial three million, I believe, to do a study on how best to do this partnership model with that spectrum. And the key benefit, uh, whenever I'm talking to Canada, uh, I uh, encourage them to thank us heavily because we're using the same spectrum. We have now, with our partnership with AT&T, ensured there is a device ecosystem that Canada can now pick right up and use once they figure out their path forward. Um, so that's, that's one of the other key ones. The band plan or the frequency bands for North America are very unique from outside the rest of the world. So that band 14 is really only applicable to the US and Canada. Uh, and then the other one, we just had a couple of staff return from Australia. Uh, Australia is looking to do something similar as well. Uh, and then we have a list of 10 others that are really focused on how can we give our first responders in our country that priority and preemption capability on these broadband networks and let industry drive that wave of innovation onto the 5G and 6G and ensure public safety is carried with that as it goes. Outstanding, and those are many of our, our partners obviously as Absolutely. well. So it's really, it's great to see that consistent change happening internationally. So we've got two, roughly about 230 local, state, tribal, NGO, and federal agency partners here with us. Many of them are with first responder and emergency management agencies, some law enforcement, kind of the whole diversity of different oh. disciplines. Yeah. And from your perspective and all your experience, what can we as public safety leaders um, do differently to affect and cultivate change in our agencies towards adopting and embracing um, all of this latest technology? Great question. And I was talking to the, the gentleman here uh, in the front row about some of the challenges with procurement and changing contracts and uh, some of the hurdles, uh, you know, change is hard, <laughs> but we now have this process and this network available for first responders to use that brings them these features they fought for, and it's actually going back to 20 years now. I believe uh, 1997 is when they were first set aside spectrum in 700 megahertz for both narrowband and broadband. So public safety drove this network for the last 20 years and ultimately was able to get Congress to agree to give them spectrum and funding to start the build and, and move this forward. We now have an excellent partner with AT&T. Uh, we are driving those uh, innovations into their network as well. But we also know, and I've heard this from public safety numerous times, Number one, coverage is king. Number two, price is queen. So that's really the key focus for the community and the first responders and those that pay for their subscriptions if they are paid for. We have a lot of the community that doesn't get reimbursed or paid for their use of wireless communications. Mm -hmm. So we've also driven into the network of bring your own device capability because we knew that was key for a lot of the volunteer firefighters and others that are first responders outside their normal jobs. We wanted them to have that capability and use of the network as well. That being said, Congress did not mandate that anyone use this network. We feel there's no other competitor that can meet what we have done for public safety. Because again, it was built on public safety's needs and requirements for what they wanted this network to do. We have a dedicated core infrastructure, 24 by seven security operations center that all the public safety traffic is separate and unique from the commercial traffic on AT&T's network. Uh, exhaustive list of roaming partners and the capabilities that will be driven into this going forward. Uh, so the key takeaway for me is FirstNet is there, it's available. Coverage may not be there yet. We are pushing as hard as we can in AT&T as well, adding band 14 to this going forward. We want to hear from public safety if it's coverage. Where do we not have coverage? Where can we put those investment dollars to ensure the expansion of this network happens? 
Is it additional deployables? Is it additional SAT colts that are needed? Hey, you've got 72, that's great. AT&T has another 500 on call that they use for their normal business as usual commercial response. Are there more that are needed there that we should invest in? So that's really the goal and focus. Events like this, understanding the use of broadband data for public safety, now that you have a, a network you can rely on and use and your traffic is prioritized, what is the realm of possibility that you'd like to see on this going forward? So that's really what we'll be focused on and understanding over the next several years. at and working to build now, but we're not going to just stop at the contract award. We'll continue to drive those capabilities going forward. Very exciting. Actually, that leads me right into my next question, which is how can some of the folks involved here today or back at their home agencies get involved with FirstNet, be that helping to define some of the requirements like what you started Absolutely. to allude to, um, but also maybe efforts underway at the lab or anything else that you see a connection to? Yep, great question. So next week we'll be having our quarterly board meetings. So the other unique aspect with the First Responder Network Authority, the legislation uh, required the creation of a 15 member board, very similar to a public company or a private company. We have a board of directors made up of public safety from all four disciplines, as well as some federal government standing chairs with the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Management and Budget, uh, as well as the Department of Justice that sit on this board, along with industry veterans from telecommunications and the wireless industry. So that board really helps drive a lot of our day-to-day -day, um, investments and, and capabilities that we're doing now. Uh, they review our operation budgets, they're also, as part of that, the Public Safety Advisory Committee reports out. And those associations that make up the Public Safety Advisory Committee are a really good first start. We'll be having a lot of events and other functions happening over the next several years. We'll be uh, advertising those. We have dedicated YouTube channels as well as all the social media platforms uh, that we'll be uh, asking for public safety's participation going forward. So highly encourage you, if you're not aware, Go to firstnet.gov, understand what associations are uh, made up within our advisory committee, and ensure that the representative from that committee knows who you are, your ideas, or things that you'd like them to bring forward for the committee, and FirstNet on the authority side to understand. Very exciting. Thank you very and much. And all those Bob. board meetings and PSAC meetings are actually uh, public and live streamed as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find those on the website for next week's round of meetings as well. Excellent. We'll be sure to include those on the sure. site following this as well. So kind of wrapping up here before we allow a couple of questions from the audience, what is one thing that you would like to leave um, our participants with today? It can be anything, an anecdote or, you know, a, a kind of a, a key from your experience. Sure. Great question. And, and that is, um, I've learned the public safety community is never shy. <laughs> Please don't be shy. Please uh, inform your agencies and your associations that you work and represent through uh, the needs that you have for this network. Again, the FirstNet Authority, everyone on the staff I can vouch for, we're all so honored that we get to support public safety in their mission in saving lives. We are here to ensure they get the capabilities they need. So please stay involved. Please reach out. Uh, contact information is available all over our .gov website. There's also the firstnet.com website. So that is actually the focused features, devices, other capabilities for the network that you can go on and look at today to see what the benefits are. Uh, but again, we, we want public safety involvement. We have not done anything as a government agency uh, on the federal side to say, we know what's best, here's how we're gonna do it. We've done everything in hand with public safety ensuring where we understand their needs and what they wanted out of this network. That is not changing now that we have a contract partner. We are driving them on public safety's behalf for that. So the key, key message for me is please stay involved. Please uh, uh, continue to advocate for what you feel is best and what you need on this network and out of the network going forward. We've got a lot of activity surrounding back to some of the key things we're worked on, working on in the lab uh, is this location-based services concept and the Z-axis you know, being able to locate a downed firefighter in an X, Y, and Z coordinated, coordinate, coordinates uh, within a 10 meter location bubble. That is a huge challenge. The, the wireless industry hasn't solved that for wireless 911 callers yet either. But we're driving that because the, the community and public safety told us 
we need that in this network. So we are pushing forward with that. Uh, I think we'll see some great uh, breakthroughs on that in the near future. And that's an example of ideas and things that public safety has told us. We need this. How can we get it? What can we do to do that? Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I would like to give just a chance if there's one or two burning questions in the audience, sure a chance to answer Absolutely. them. Any questions from for Jeff? I see one. We have one right over here. Charlotte's going to come around with a microphone for you. A mic. Great. Chris Berhaney, DHS. Uh, Chris. We have um, a, in our NPPD, yep. uh, the National NCC IC, I think they did some work on uh, Hurricane Harvey. Here's a question. Um, I, I think you mentioned um, uh, AT&T capability that involved, what, did you say trucks that could provide for down cell towers? Absolutely. The, it's called the SAT Colt. It's a satellite backhaul cell on light truck. And as part of our contract, there are 72 of those now deployed across the states that respond to disasters. Okay. So here's a comment question. I assume that their uh, area of coverage is height limited by whatever antenna they can raise up. Um, much higher than that would be there would be a tethered aerostat or a UAV acting as a mobile yep. comms tower. Those exist. Verizon uses them. I think they would uh, maybe more affordably cover a much larger area, and that's something that you and AT&T may want to consider. Absolutely. And a year ago, we hosted our board that I mentioned, of which Ron Hewitt, who is uh, the, the current representative from DHS on our board, uh, and we actually have had the AT&T tethered a, a, a UAV that provides what you're talking about. It can get up higher, provide a footprint of coverage. Uh, th those are in progress and development now. Uh, so we're excited with some of that capability in those areas where honestly you can't get a sat truck down in there. How can you get covered to those areas? Those were uh, leveraged in some of the Puerto Rico recovery efforts as well. And they're learning lessons from uh, how those can best be used going forward. Great question, thank you. So I think we have one time for one more sure. question here in the back, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure thing. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Charles Laird with North Carolina. So I know there's a lot of focus on devices, mobile devices, tablets, things like that. Um, are you guys doing any research or innovation with uh, IoT devices, um, connected fire trucks, things like that, in the uh, first net lab? Great question. Um, we've had a lot of discussions recently with AT&T on the Internet of Things. Uh, we've also been advocating what we've termed the internet of life-saving things. So we're not so much worried about the thermostats in your house. We're more worried about those sensors and capabilities for first responders. Um, we, back to the fire community, we've learned a lot on a lot of the biometrics that uh, commanders are interested in. A uh, lesson I learned and, and a unique uh, aspect I hadn't thought of. A lot of firefighters don't die in the fires. They actually die from heart uh, stress and after the fact, having that capability to understand what's going on. We have a lot of development in that space and the current device list has a few of those. Uh, I mentioned the laptops, there's other capabilities that I know are in the pipeline. Uh, over the next six to nine months, you'll be hearing lots of those on the FirstNet network and how those will be uh, leveraging the band 14 spectrum as well. Um, that, that's a great tee up for uh, this morning before I walked in. The, the Smart Cities Alliance announced and, and identified for their technology of the year, they have awarded FirstNet that technology of the year. They see a, a natural benefit with the Smart Cities deployment, Internet of Things, Internet of Life Saving Things. So we were honored that Smart Cities chose FirstNet as the technology of the, of the year for their uh, annual award list as well. So great question. Stay on the lookout. There's, there's definitely a lot of capability coming for IoT in the future. Thank you so much, Great. Jeff. Thank really you, appreciate it.